good morning to all of you uh, yesterday we ended the session with professor arvin's engaging talk on the subaltern writings outside the canon a very interesting question came out yesterday and that was can the subaltern really write and that question had you know stimulated an engaging discussion we discussed the problem of representation of the subalterns as well so uh, coming to think of it as we discuss subaltern writings we cannot turn away uh, from the emerging literatures in english from the northwestern part of india their writings break the stereotypical representation of the northwest as uh, as a difficult terrain to tread in or a land of the insurgent today our speaker is professor namrata pathak uh, who will talk on the poetry from the northeastern region of india but before we go ahead a little a bit of introduction on the kind of poetry the kind of writings from the northeastern part of india so poetry from the northeast has invariably dealt with issues of oppression subjugation invisibility silences and gaps in the periphery however this writings also question a legacy of what is being discarded this devalue and discredited in the context of the northeast a detailed study of the poetry from the northeastern region showcases the fact that the socio cultural scenario of a region like the northeast cannot be represented without alluding to the struggles over the meanings of democracy definition of a legitimate authority and control policies and practices exemplifying the clashes of ideas in local communities and state legislatures principles of land acquisition and tags of identity attached to it such assertions get accentuated if we take into account the partition narratives sagas of violence and conflict and also a tinge of restraint that undercuts any ideological assumption on modes of victimization and the intense pain and anger associated with it uh, professor patak's talk will border around on the creation of the transformative spaces in poetry from the northeast region northeastern region and the various kinds of transgressions that accompany the process ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to introduce professor pathak who teaches in the department of english in the northeastern hill university tura meghalaya she has an mphil and phd from english and foreign languages university formerly known as ciaef in hyderabad she has four books to her credit and her latest are forthcoming from sahitya academy and rutledge her articles and creative writings have found a place in vyavya uh, cafe de census northeast review uh, the thumbprint magazine a uh, bengaluru review wagon magazine to name a few she has been a recipient of fct ford foundation fellowship and ugc associates associates by iias shimla she is currently working on a book on drama and theater and an anthology of poems from the northeast india our debut collection of poems that's how mirai it's a pomegranate was brought out in 2018 by red river our poems are included in the sangam house monsoon issue a special on poetry from northeast july 2019 and anthologies forthcoming from alif and other publishing houses so ladies and gentlemen now i will hand over to professor namrata patak uh, to to continue with her talk over to you namrata uh, good morning everyone uh, it is indeed a pleasure and it's my privilege to get associated with each one of you uh, i am going to share my screen here just one second yeah Uh, well uh, the title of my uh, talk is transgression and transformation 
uh, in literature, an overview of select poetry from the Northeast. Well, uh, the first thing that really strikes me heard is the fact that it's really, really problematic to define the cluster of states that we term as the Northeastern states. Typically, like when we talk about the homogeneous definitions, right, that we usually tend to stick to. So we club the states together, we club the sentiments together, we club the social mores and values together of a particular zone of area that is termed as the fringes or the periphery. And when the idea of definition itself is problematic, when naming is based on the axis of selection and obliteration, so how and in what way can we do justice to this particular nomenclature called poetry from the Northeast? Now, my talk is more about throwing up certain insights and actually throwing up certain series of interrogations and I would just try my best to problematize some accepted norms that are very much prevalent and afloat when we usually discuss poetry from this particular area called the Northeast. Now, there are certain allusions or there are certain terms that we invoke when we try to define what poetry is or what kind of poetry is produced in this zone called the Northeastern terrain. Now, poetry. Uh, well, sorry, a uh, poetry by certain writers here, like Robin Gangom, Temsula Ao, Mona Zote, Nabina Das, Sumana Roy, Nitu Das, to name a few. So poetry, according to these writers, is a very, very intense mode of retaliation. It's all about answering back. And it's a very, very, you know, very, very interesting way of mixing up diverse ingredients. And the stance that all these poets take is, of course, a very, very fiery, temperamental and liberating kind of a stance because this is post-colonial in vain and because they try to subvert the accepted norms. And therefore, we can say that the poems that I'll be taking up today to define what poetry is. So these poems are very, very liberating in fashion and mode. And also I'm talking about coagulation of a certain specific idea. And what kind of a coagulation is this? Now we are talking about assimilation of multiple voices and the two writers that I am invoking today, uh, Nabina Das and Nitu Das. So both of them, they, they employ this particular technique of polyphony, where they mix up voices, multiple voices, the voices of the downtrodden, the voices of the subaltern, the voices of the voiceless within quotes. And they make the space a very, very polyphonic space, which at once is liberating. And also it alludes to the dimensions of heterogeneity of these kinds of writings from the periphery. Now, the writings from the Northeast interrogate the canonical text, the elitist practices, and the heterosexist assumptions of culture. Now, not only this, now, these writings question a legacy of what are being discarded, devalued, and discredited in the context of the Northeast. Now, before I move to the other uh, slide, now, this is a particular aspect that we need to toy with. And the aspect is this, that these writers produced or disseminated this particular chance of knowledge. And when it comes to knowledge production, we need not forget that this is produced at the times of administrative high-handedness during the turmoil created by certain insurgency and counter-insurgency movements. And also at the same time, we have to talk about the meanings of democracy in a war-torn area, the definitions of legitimacy, of proper governance. And also at the same time, we need to know about the crisis and struggles about land acquisition and how the tags of identity are attached to a particular demographic space. So these uh, counter hegemonic alliances would be woven into the fabric of my talk. Now, uh, well, uh, the first thing that we need to understand is the fact that poetry has to be sold. 
Now, the representation of a reason like the Northeast is aligned with diverse systems of knowledge production. Now, what does it mean? It also means that the writers need to be heard and they also have to sell their products in a national and global market. And all of us, we are aware of the fact that certain pieces sell and certain pieces do not sell. And there are certain yardsticks to judge what is a piece of successful writing because the writing has to find a particular readership. It has to cater to a particular group of people. So how does it happen? And what are the saleable ingredients of the Northeast? There are certain publishing houses like Penguin, Aleph, Routledge, to name a few, who are quite interested to publish writings from the Northeast. Why? For whose interest? Is there a particular motive behind that act of popularity? Certain writers are eulogized. Certain writers are put at the pedestal or hero worshipped. At what cost? Is it because of the fact that violence is saleable. Now, the two poets that I'll be taking up would be catering to this very, very important and polemical questions. Now, again, we need to be aware of the fact that there is this ongoing categorization between mainstream culture and the other culture. Now, this is a term on which I want to emphasize a bit more. Now, who is the other? How is the other created? What are the processes of otherization? Now, we are, to, we, we are aware of the fact that 4 million people could not make it to the NRC in the Northeastern area. Now, why are these people silenced? And why don't we talk about them? And when it comes to political documentation, record keeping in the archives, these are totally erased from the face of history. Now, what is the fate of these people? Now, again, like when we talk about other culture, we need to be aware of the fact that constantly there is an attempt by the powerful lot to reskill and de-skill the voiceless usually the, the women here in this particular context because I have a vestal interest in choosing the two women writers here, Nitu Das and Nabina Das. Secondly, what about the people who are incarcerated in asylums and prisons? Next, what about the women who dwell in the source Sapuris and the bank of the river Brahmaputra. Now, this is a phenomenon which is quite unique to the northeastern terrain because here we are talking about certain faceless ghost citizens of the nation who dwell in a patch of land called Sars and the Sars disappear during the time of the yearly flood, which is devastating, which is terrible, and the Sars appear after some time, say some months and some years. Now, the ones who dwell in the Sarsapuris, they do not have any other option but to move about, loiter here and there, and this homeless people, the state, somehow strategically eliminates them because of certain reasons. Now, the same state bangs on them when it comes to this big, big vote bank that these people in a way signify. Now, the government plays a very, very sinister game here. Now, these people are needed when the government wants a kind of political electoral support from this lot. But when it comes to the egalitarian principles of the society, when it comes to doing certain substantial and worthwhile stuff for their democratic rights, for their freedom for their, you know, some kind of you know, ed, like, like mingling up in a particular you know, space. You call that the national space, right? You call it the country, the way they belong to that space, how and in what way they belong to that space. Now, what are the criteria for which they should be called the proper citizens of Assam? So when it comes to these questions, the government always skips mum. Now, these two writers that I'll be taking up, they talk about this very, very dense and political issues and poetry becomes a breeding ground for resistances, for different modes 
of resistances for different kinds of retaliations. So it's a zone which is used for answering back. Well, uh, in this context or in this vein, uh, I want to put a particular like paragraph from a very, very important book uh, called the Anthology, the Oxford Anthology of Writings from the Northeast by Tilotama Mishra. It's an edited book. Now, Tilotama Mishra in this vein contents, the main waves of cultural invasion that have wrought significant changes in the literary world of the region originated in the Bhakti movement, followed by the various reformist dispensations of the 19th century, colonialism and the Christian missionary activities that accompanied it and the new culture of development that has become a part of global culture. Each of these encounters resulted in different forms of resistance as well as appropriations. The clash of cultures has often led to the loss of traditional forms and the adoption of new cultural icons that threaten the existing ones. So in this context, I want to um, allude to a particular poem uh, called When the Prime Minister Visited Shillong, the Bamboo Stood in Silence by King Kham Singh Nongkindri, who happened to be a renowned poet based in Shillong, Meghalaya. Now, in that particular poem, Kim Pham laments, and the, the, the note of mourning runs through the text, of course. And what kind of a mourning is that? Now, Kim Pham says that Shillong is, of course, of course, regarded as a cosmopolitan hub. But slowly there is an erasure of indigeneity. Slowly there is a particular kind of, you know, what do you call that? You call that a, a, a loss. It's a kind of a cultural loss. It's a, it's a loss of their own matter. It's a loss of their own indigenous matter. And Kim Kham says that when outsiders, within quotes, they come and they just try to be there or when they inhabit Shilao, which is a part of Meghalaya, and they boast, they boast that this place is different. This place is cosmopolitan in vain. And here, like, we have you know, a very, very idyllic way of perceiving the bounty of nature. Shillong is beautiful, it's picturesque, it's dotted by pines and the, the blue hills, the hills that change colors, and we have those dot town plum cherries teasing you in winter. You have the fresh oranges, you know, the, 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 the tasteful oranges, juicy to the core, and you have the apple red chicks of the Kongs. You know, it's a welcoming sight, apparently. But Kim Pham digs deep. And he really calls for a kind of negotiation and resolution in the sense that, like, we invite people, right? We invite people, but we also at the same time need to be aware of the fact that there is a steep chasm between who an outsider is and who an insider is. Because insiders like us, we do not want those people to come and define identity in their own terms and snatch away our rights or snatch away what is actually our, our say like land, what is actually our own lived experience or what is our taste of sustenance or our modes of livelihood. So that's Kim Pham Singh Dong Kigri. Now he again says that the bamboos, the silent bamboos, they hang their head down and they look up and they realize that the prime minister is here and hence the hula ballo. People are going berserk over him. And of course there are cover-ups. People are putting on multiple marks to just show him that Shillong is a vista of peace, which it is not. Now again, Kim Pham's poem is important because the poem lays bare the idea of cultural invasion, how the insiders to a certain point can resist that but are totally helpless at the face of or at the wake of certain moments of conflict and certain moments of urgency and there are certain, certain incidents of collision which actually create havoc in their lives. Now again, well, 
before I move to the concept of the other, so let me just give you a historical trajectory of evolution of the concept in terms of the Northeast. Now, the Northeastern states have seen different kinds of religious reformist propaganda. Now, like in the initial stages, we have the influence of Shakta, Shaiva, Vaishnava religions in three states, Tripura, Manipur, and Assam. And then again, uh, the, the Northeastern zone endured 120 years of reign of the Thai Ahoms. And not only that, we have uh, different kinds of Christian missionary me, uh, reformative uh, capsules which are thrown here and there and the establishment of schools and other other official you know you know nodes and buildings and structures that perpetuate the norms of the government right and we also understand what normativity is now not only that uh well what is the other like when we talk about the northeast, the way we look at an other is totally different from the way we look at an other in the mainland India. Purposefully, I am actually, in a way, breeding that node of difference because it's always about the way of perception, it's always about the visual angle, it's always about who looks at whom from or what angle and I am reminded of Salman Rushdie's metaphor of the cinematograph, right? It also depends on the distance, it depends on the angle of vision. It's just like when you are very, very close to a particular incident, it's hazy, it's blurred, and when you are actually distantly placed at the same time, the vision is uncomfortable, it's fragmented. So you need to have a particular distance here. You have to be placed at the proper angle of vision in order to partake of the spectacle. Now, the other is looked at from a particular angle that we discussed, and the other is created for some kinds of sinister motives that we also understood. And who is the other? Now, Edward Said is pivotal, like his theoretical discourses are pivotal in unleashing a theory of the other. And all of us, we are aware of the fact that in his book named Orientalism, which came out in the year 1978, he talked about the perceived weakness of the marginalized groups. And at the same time, he stresses on the alleged strength of those in positions of power. Now, Foucault again talked about the Panoptican vision, right? That you are there in the Panoptican and you have the power of the panoramic view. You can look at the inmates of the jail and the inmates are powerless in the sense that they cannot in a, look, in a way look at you. So this, you are conspicuous. You are hidden from the gaze of the other because you are powerful and at the same time, you have the authority to document, to write or to narrate the experience of the other. And this stance is totally problematic according to somebody like I Chakravarti. Now, what actually hits me hard is the fact that Sai talks about the truth of language, which is very, very malleable and relative according to him. Now, Sai says that language is created by metaphors, metonyms, it's a spatial literary language, and of course there's a sum of human relations that are added to that. See, this embellished, transposed, enhanced language, or the way you document the particular incident, right, you being the powerful one, documenting the experience of the other, because you've already rendered the other voiceless, so somebody has to speak, like, on behalf of the other, somebody has to be the spokesperson of the other. Now that stance is totally problematic at the same time it's political. Now these truths are created. The truth of existence, the truth of language, the truth of the other, which later becomes a norm, which later becomes a law, which later becomes the patterns of normativity. Now, these are the illusions, and these illusions are transformed into the hard facts of life that we internalize. And maybe that's why the discourse of the other needs a thorough interrogation according to Edward Said. Now, because I'll be dealing with two feminist poets, so I thought 
Uh, it's better if I wrote in some theoretical moorings of Simone de Beauvoir, who talked about alternate reutilization of the Hegelian self as the dichotomy. Now here she said that Simone de Beauvoir said that the other is the minority, of course the least favored one, and who is this? least favored one or who is the minority here of course the woman now the man on the other hand like if we pick him against the woman who is the other who is the minority who is the least favored one the man is always visible it's positive i'm talking about the woman who is negative who is not there the fellows is lacking again if i am reminded of laka laka talks about the absence of the fellows there's a lack somewhere. Now, again, man is a neutral term. And the problem lies in the fact that we use that neutral common term to designate human beings in general. So therein sits in the idea of pushing somebody, the, the voiceless, the muted entity to the backstage or to the fringes, right? And then again, uh, Nitudas, the first poet uh, whom I'll be discussing, uh, she talks about, let me just give you a, a brief background uh, about Nitudas and like what kind of poet does she write, sorry, poetry does she write and she dabbles in different kinds of uh, like aspects here. She's a multitasker, she's a birder, she's a caricaturist and she's a lecturer at the same time. Uh, she talks about, in her poems, she talks about liminal spaces or in-between spaces. Now it's very interesting because she talks about certain uses of landscapes and she says that private value is dependent on the public use of certain landscapes. And by landscapes, I mean the different spaces that are available to women notwithstanding the domestic sphere, notwithstanding the public front from where the woman is expelled at the drop of the head. So she's talking about all those spaces and there's an enmeshing of multiple spaces in Mitu Das's poems. Now again, her writings in a way move in a double mind. See, there is an urge to unsettle orders and at the same time there is a craving to structure certain things anew she is the creator and at the same time she is the created and not only this now she talks about certain semiotic encodings of mores in the female body she talks about how the body is controlled and how the same body retaliates, resists, and when it becomes a locus of violence, it has the power to break free of the shackles. So this is the same body which is a victim and the same body which actually shouts at the top of its voice, screams, creates havoc, lets things go haywire and in a way remodules, reformulates or restructures the patriarchal codes in her own terms. So the body itself becomes a doubled up, no, nope, doubled up, very, very polyphonic and malleable entity. You cannot pin it down. It's really, really, you no, know, in a way spills there is a spill somewhere and there is the sense of access that if they not, cannot hold it to a particular space, not within the confines of your home or not, you can put it there in the border or the margins of a text. That's how the body works in Itudas's poetry. Now, the, her first book is Boki and the second book is Cyborg Proverbs. And Boki, like, uh, of course, we have an SMS flavor here. Uh, Boki is about this rhetorical overflow of words. It does not mean anything. Like, it's just like the devil of a child. You go on and on and on. And you are just showing your angst. You are raving and ranting. And because 
call it boki in SMS, right? We just ask, kyo boki aso? Like, why are you going on and on and on? Now, she says that boki gives her a sense of plenitude. And boki is important because it's also about not being able to tame or domesticate the proliferations. Or these are the linguistic proliferations, and this is a creature feminine, right? So this is the language of a woman, and it's just like a fluid. It behaves in that way. It's viscous, and it takes a particular shape. You put it in a vessel, and it becomes what you want it to become, and hence the symbolic overtures of the title Boki. Now, the poem that I'm going to take is from Cyborg Proverbs. And then before I move to that, uh, let me just talk a bit about Nikodas's concept of anthropomorphism, which means like she gives a secret life to everyday objects, mundane ones, trivial ones like scissors, safety pins, withered leaves, fractals, puppets, dolls, so on and so forth. So if you happen to be her friend, you will notice Nikodas embellishing the safety pins, putting a head there, adding hair there, and lo, the safety pin becomes a woman. So it's just like investing uh, in an emit thing with life. Now, this is a charm of Nitu Das's poetry. Everything comes alive. Now, let me just take uh, some portions. Now, these are some sentences that I have taken from his poem called Jokini, which means a witch in essence. And uh, here I go. And I can't stop laughing. I laugh because I have nothing else to do. My laugh becomes one with the wind and the pollen and the cries of the children. Well, uh, of course, we are talking about a witch laughing and it's reverberating. The entire area is reverberating, echoing with the sound of this very, very you know, different laughter different within quotes, abnormal within quotes, laughter of the witch. She is the Jokini. Of course, she is not a regular stereotypical woman. She is the other here. Now, here, what is the metaphor of laughing? See, but the metaphor of laughing is, uh, no, it's very, very interesting here because I, at the same time, I am reminded of a phenomenal essay by Ilan Sigzu, The Laugh of the Medusa, where she talks about how you cannot, in a way, control the laughter of that woman called Medusa. And she has snaky hair all over. She's the other. She does not stick to the beauty norms. And one look at Medusa, oof, low. You, you will be reduced to ashes. Such is the power of this woman. Now, when it comes to the appearance of a woman, like what does she look like here? Laughter, uncontrollable laughter, and then you have long hair, and then you have fiery eyes. And of course, at the same time, you are somebody who is feared, People are terrified by you because you pose as a threat to the accepted social paradigms. And Nitu does usually, in a way, does that with her poem, Jokini. So there is installation and subversion going hand in hand. She installs the figure of the female who is different, who is abnormal, who is not beautiful, who is not pretty. And this woman, who is the Jokini, uh, well, let me just move to this one. Uh, she has a totally different abode. She lives in, on the branch of a tree and she looks at uh, Dr. Da's bedroom. And again, I'm reminded of Foucault because here, like the Jokini has the bird's eye view of everything, like what Dr. Da is doing in his bedroom, what he is up to without being looked at. Now, this is the idea of the gaze, which has been totally, totally mangled by Nitu Das. It's not the man who is actually putting you under surveillance by gazing at you. It's the other way around, where the Jokini, the witch, from the beautiful branch of the tree, she is hidden in the canopy, in the foliages. Nobody can, in a way, know that in the tree we have 
this jokini leaving for years and years and years without being seen. Now, the secretive idea of not being looked at rather looking at everything, right? So it brings to the fore Nitu Das's ways of unsettling the reader's complacency. She, she renders the reader a very, very, you know, what to say, um, thinking, intellectually active, not passive, person who is engaged with the ways of documentation, with the ways of writing. Now, at the same time, well, uh, let me just move to the other um, slide here. Uh, this is again um, from Nitu Das. Now, the title of the poem is Against Hair, and uh, it was published in her collection called Cyber Proverbs, which was brought out by Poetry Wala two years back. Now, I'm just reading uh, the sentences here because I find them quite interesting. Against hair. She once told me she never combed her hair, knotted knee length, lice rhythm. Hair that could decode all stories. Her hair is twice sung and twice surrender. The split ends are tributaries. Dibang, Tameng, Dhonsiri, Subansiri, the dendruff, stardust, the gray, filaments of the day. Now you must have noticed that this witch, of course this is a part of a witch series. So this witch carries the reverse, the tributaries, the filaments of the day, the stardust, the gray, everything in her hair. So the hair of the witch becomes a mini compressed universe. Now, this is the universe which is totally at odds with your world because hers is a non regulatory world and hers is a world of growth and bounty. Because here we are not talking about trimming the hair, here we are talking about letting go. So, so in that way, this is very, very interesting. Now, well, uh, let me just, in a way, uh, give you the background of this very, very important bill called the Assam Witch Hunting Prohibition, Prevention and Protection Bill of 2015, which was tabled in the State Assembly um, in 2000, of course, the same year, following a very, very uh, terrible event, a gory and macabre event, uh, of murder of a woman from Sonitpur district. This is a 63 years old woman called Puni Orang, and she was paraded naked, beaten up, and she was beheaded by a mob of 100 women who happened to be her neighbors and distant relatives. Only because the village Diodhani, who is a self proclaimed goddess, claimed that this woman named Puni Orang, she practices black magic and she is the cause of deaths and misfortunes of many in the village. Now, this is the background against which Nitu Das wrote and her Jokini poems, the poems on the witches, right? The series, worship Puni Aura. And it's celebratory in vain because when I asked Nitu about like uh, the, 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 the inspiration or the propelling factor behind the creation of such a profound poetic discourse, she replied and she responded, she told me that this is my answer to Puri Orang. This is, this is how she should have reacted to the people who tried to ostracize her or who was labeled a fallen woman by the entire village and without any fault of this woman. So this woman was murdered at stark daylight and nobody came to her rescue. So Nitu Das in a way said that so this witch series, so in those series, Puni Orang is the narrator. The witch narrates here because otherwise the witch was not given a chance to speak her mind. Well, um, Birubala Devi, she is a known figure in Assam, especially for her awareness programs on witch hunting all over. And she is quite successful in sanitizing the masses in the nook and corner of Assam in the rural settings. 
Now, uh, I'm moving to my last, I mean to say I only took two women poets here, uh, to my second uh, writer, uh, the women poet, uh, who is Nabina Das. And in her writings, we come across the projections of an outsider. Like she is very, very empathetic to the figure of the outsider. And in an interview in Scroll, she said that she has certain reasons behind that. Firstly, she said that we need to understand the colonial dispensations. And she said that like the Britishers were the ones who invited the landless farmers the laborers from East Bangladesh and other famine hit areas to Assam so that they could work in the jute factories. Now, during that time, already the state was reeling under pressure of Kola Jor, epidemic which actually gripped many lives. Many lives were lost. And also, like, uh, when we talk about civil war and invasion of Myanmar, which caused economic downslide in Assam. And the Britishers wanted people who would be working in those jute factories and other areas and in other spots without demanding a huge amount of money. So actually, according to Nabina Das, the outsider within courts was invited by the Britishers long time back to settle there to work for the economic benefits of the people, the insiders within courts, and also like, uh, and also she said that we we need to be aware of the fact that the other is here, the other is the outsider, the other is what the self is not. Now, again, in this vein, let me invoke Jacques Derrida, who said that the other is indispensable for us. Jacques Derrida went to the length of proclaiming that we are constantly bound to the other. We are obligated to the other because when we stare at the other, we refuse to understand or we refuse to look at the nodes of intersection that there's certain nodes of commonality between i and you but i seldom look at that i always look at the aspects attributes mores and values that i do not like and i find all of them in the figure of the other now nadina does in a way puts everything together and she takes a ladle and it's just like she's mixing up the ingredients, the chunks of history, socio-political settings, and also the fact that the state dispensations, right, that the state also requires some people for its own growth and the state also needs to obliterate or expel some people at the same time. So the political moves that in a way design a particular state or designate a particular state or somehow you no know, in a way colors the mindset of the dwellers there so they have to be taken account of when we are defining the other or when we are defining the outsider and in an essay in scroll she talks about the very very unfortunate murder of gauri day a pregnant bengali woman in meghalaya uh, she was murdered in a very, very, you know, like inhuman way where her fetus was taken out of her, uh, like tummy, and all the internal organs were somehow taken out. A dagger was poked at her chest, and the murderers twisted the dagger. So it, the, the sight was such, such, such a terrible one that it would have evoked raw emotions in each and every person in the world. Why? What was her fault? In most of her poems, she questions that. Like, and she, she wrote a poem on Gauri Day as well. Why was she murdered? Only because she was a Bengali? Only because she had her roots somewhere else? And then in the same context, she talks about how and in what way we can never ever find home. What is the idea of home? Home is a very very abstract concept which we carry here in our heads home can never be concrete yes we have this inclination to 
posit that idea in a typical demographic space, which is erroneous for Nabina Das. She talks about uh, a short story, Mariam, in that article in school, uh, penned down by Jayanta Saikia. Mariam is about uh, a Mia woman uh, who was looking at the border you know, like uh, of Bangladesh and Meghalaya and wondering her fate because before her wedding or prior to her marriage to uh, Mia, like in Assam, she was a part of the other part of the country, Bangladesh. Now she traveled, she crossed the borders, the borders are anyway porous. Now she settles there in Assam and she was debated to cross the borders and meet her parents. Now she looks up and there are rows of clouds there and the, the, there is a flock of birds and the birds cross the borders in a jiffy and she kept wondering like what detained her from being the birds because we should have also done the same it would just take two seconds for Mariam to cross the borders and be there with her parents and stay there for some time but she was not allowed why she doesn't have a passport next because the border was guarded by the police by the army and there are certain vigilant forces there why because there is immense paperwork why because Mariam does not have a proof of identity so she cannot in this particular life in her lifetime would have the good fortune of meeting her parents again and she wants to be a bird soaring high up in the blue sky and she says that birds or nature or you no know, the, the the animals the the animate the flora and fauna whatever you call that right the birds the animals the trees the sky the oceans the water bodies they do not know what a border is so why am i fated to worship that line of division that line of demarcation that separates me from my kith and kin now the outsider has different names it's called vai in mizoram the car in meghalaya and Bahirar Manu in Assamese. So this Bahirar Manu populate the poems of Nabina Das. Well, now uh, this is uh, an excerpt of her poem called Poetry Forms, uh, which was published in this collection called Blue Vessel by Red River. Uh, let me just read uh, the sentences here. Wonder what which was it that stirred a mixture of petals, opium poppy and other leaves? Plato's portion, or an ointment to help them all, fly to readings, recite verses with the other witches. Well, uh, you must have noticed that towards the concluding part, we have the idea of female friendship and bonding, which Adrian Rich highlighted in her feminist manifestos. Now, Nabina Das talks about the importance and significance of the same sex bonding. And she says that these ties or these kinds of you know, connections, relationships, the labyrinth of connections. So it empowers a woman. And it's also about how collectively you can topple over or you can somehow to a particular extent throw your own ideas at the face of somebody who's always there to control you and who's always there to put you down so this is her way of resisting and you call it collective resistance because here she's talking about women power and again this idea of mixing everything because the witches they have a cauldron and it's thought that they mix like very very odd and extraordinary objects, right? I'm reminded of the three witches of Shakespeare's Macbeth. And like this idea of mixing is again a gesture to break that line of division between the insider and the outsider, which is of course a construct. Now, uh, well, uh, this particular poem is taken from Sanskar Nama. Can I tell you all this? No, there you go scared to hear a woman out the way she was grabbed hurt and let go to die 
Now she names the poem Another Toba Texi. Now here she, it's a hypertext according to Nabina Das. It's a hypertext to Sadat Hasan Manto's Toba Texin. And all of us, we have read the short story. We are bowled over by the short story. It is a very, very endearing ending. Rather, it poses lots of questions. It's an open-ended short story. Now, Toba Texin dies in a patch of land which is neither Indian nor a part of Pakistan. Now, there also she's talking about the in-between gray zones of life where you are constantly afloat. There is a chain of signifiers and here she's talking about a hyper-simulation of senses because in Nabina Das you get to see, you get to see a lot, you get to hear, you get to hear a lot, you get to feel, you get to feel a lot. So the olfactory tactile senses and also the visual paradigms that are stepped into her writings they talk about an overstimulation which you cannot control perhaps you are a window shopper you are a stroller in the crowd you move from one shop to the other and you partake of all the spectacles now that's who you are as a reader when you happen to come across Navina Das's poetry. Now, again here, uh, in this particular sentence, uh, which I have curled from one of her articles in first post, she talks about how and in what way erasure becomes a norm. She says that a woman has the power to actually take the darkest ink and blot the day. She has the power to reach the sky. She has the power to feed the fire. She burns, she animates, she is a growing organism. She ensnares you, she mesmerizes you, she troubles you at the same time. She poses questions, she's everywhere. It's all about being everywhere. Now, she says, even after that, even after knowing that we cannot be put in a limited restrictive space as women, why do we allow others to do what they are doing to us? Or why do we accept erasure as a norm? Why are we constantly erased, wiped off in the important historical trajectories, in the social spaces, in the important political treatises of the time? Now, that's her question to us. Now, in conclusion, uh, I would like to talk about the self-reflexive engagement that are unleashed in the poems of Nitu Das and Nabina Das. Now, it's all about an aware, self-conscious reader. It's all about installing a different kind of a worldview in the text. It's all about creating zones of confrontation and encounter so much so that as a reader you can shake hands with the writer so that as a reader you can converse with the writer exchange ideas with the writer so the idea of limitation delimitation is blown to the wind and in front of you there opens up multiple vistas of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination and they talk about a land that is constantly pushed away that is constantly misrepresented in media that is constantly not taken account of when rules are made at the center or that is constantly suffering in turmoil I call this a conflict ridden terrain and I call the literature produced there as literature of violence, literature of joy at the same time. It's not that we are constantly talking about what is denied to us. It's also about a rich repertoire of orality. It's also about 
how we are blessed by the folklore's grandmother's tales or by the stories that breed in different spaces of life it's also about sustenance it's also about living and letting the other person live thank you so much for your patient theory so i come to an end here thank you so much uh, dr pathak and it was it was indeed very insightful and many of the attendees have mentioned that you know this has been a very insightful and engaging presentation and uh, indeed it is and it has highlighted so many aspects of writings from uh, the northeastern part of uh, india and while you were talking about i mean while you were about to begin your presentation you mentioned two things like you know two things that we always talk in terms of writing one is to be heard second is how sellable it is so you know uh, keeping that thing in mind uh, we know that uh, northeast is a terrain of conflict and many literatures that is produced from from that part of the country uh, is imbued somehow is related to uh, conflict and how people have responded to it and very well in your uh, presentation you have also mentioned the other aspects also the conflicts are not within the insurgency but within ourselves within in terms of uh, the land the people even patriarchy and how how it affects the women you know part so i just wanted to ask you like you know while writing about uh, women you know uh, from the i mean from the northeastern part of india uh, do you think do you think uh, you know writing about women uh, can also be seen as a kind of equity as a source of equity or you know as a as a as, as a uh, what would i say as a uh, source through which you know your writings the uh, the writings will be more sellable people will buy and you know, would like to see how women are portrayed in the novels do you think that way? are women writing more sellable they know women more sellable to be more precise hi uh, thank you jyoti uh, for your question well uh, let me just uh, give forth a particular anecdote here like uh, this is from my first hand experience uh, i was invited to participate in a literary festival uh, two years back and uh, they wanted uh, the title of my presentation well i had to present right i had to speak i was a part of a panel and they just wanted to know about the content right so you are going to speak on what so they emailed me so uh, in response uh, in response to the mail so i just gave them a brief excerpt of my impending talk and then uh, when i was there uh, there were i came to know that there were many many sessions right and they took uh, a trouble to label or to name certain sessions and there were certain placards and there were certain hoardings and they just put the name of the session there and the name of the panelist so it was everywhere i was shocked i was shocked to find that uh, my name was put in the panel on the north right? it, it, it was something like that there were certain negative in, insinuations when i allude to the words right the words that were that in uh, in order to define or in order to designate or in order to talk about the session so they used certain trouble words and they had negative insinuations so i questioned them that what is the need to put my name uh, under the umbrella term called the literature of the north east right they said that like no you were from the northeast so i said that like okay i'm from the northeast right that's fine i understand that so that's my location i belong to that area right so i am born there but my talk is not on that my talk is on hoshang merchant my talk is on homosexual writing and my talk is on akhil kaitel i was talking about the literature of translation i was talking about uh, what this you no know, like uh, homosexual poets are doing in order to to upset the accepted gender norms and they did not pay heed to me and they told me that it doesn't matter as of you are from the northeast there are many people waiting with bated breath to actually hear you and according to the organizer 
the particular label, the not just it sells, right? It sells like hotcakes. And, 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 and I was just wondering, I was just wondering, like, why so? Because when we talk about the literature from the North East, it's very rich, it's all encompassing, and you cannot in a way specify. There is not any point of specificity, right? If you try to do that, you are again falling a trap, you know, falling a prey to your own trap. Now the thing is this, there are certain publishing houses which in a way try to deride the idea that the North East is so about other aspects of life. The North East is about the riverine areas. The North East is also about migration, the influx, the constant. It's also about you know, this very, very beautiful panoramic site that marvel, that you marvel at, that, that is very, very ensnaring for you. See, the North East is also about the, 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 the vast archives. It's also about the cultural, you know, zones, which are very, very, what to say, like dense at the same time and invigoratingly rich at, on the other hand. Now, these things are not talked about. Now, of course, there is a market and of course, there's something called market value. Of course, there is this give and take policy. And of course, there are certain aspects that sell and there are certain aspects that do not sell. So we cannot in a way, you know, uh, somehow compress everything and flatten the contours by saying that this is this and this is not this. Of course, there are certain problem areas which we need to highlight here. Thank you. Okay. That, was, that, was indeed, that, was, that was indeed very, I know, uh, important for you to talk about it because whenever we talk about North East, it's, it, it's just like, you know, writings from North East is more or less just like a tourism trip, right? You know, you go to the North East because of the mountains, valleys, it's very beautiful. And it's the same manner if you talk, if you uh, write about North East, it's, it's, it's the certain portion. I mean, you know, they are all clubbed together irrespective of the fact that we have different states and each state has different culture. So, you know, clubbing them together and, you know, putting them as a hot cake. You now people are finding it to be a hot cake. Cindy, thank you so much, Namata, uh, for, for this beautiful, engaging, you know, uh, talk. And I'm, I'm very sure, I mean, many of our uh, uh, attendees are from some from the Northeast and some of them are from Bengal and uh, even even I see few, uh, few of our attendees are also from Africa. So, you know, we have, uh, what would I say, I mean, we have a large number of uh, participants who belong to different spaces. And I believe, I mean, it was indeed very apt. And, you know, we, we started with this talk on poetry from the Northeast. And it will definitely give them some idea. We will come to know, I mean, those who do not know, those who do not uh, know about the, you know, writings from Northeast will definitely benefit from this, this talk. Thank you, Namrata. Thank you very much.